please stay tuned to the end of this program or see the show notes for important information regarding today's speakers and the content of this podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Episode 5 of Allergy Talk, a roundup of the latest in the field of allergy and immunology by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. For today's episode, we are reviewing three more articles from the July-August 2019 issue of Allergy Watch, a bi-monthly publication which provides research summaries to college members from the major journals in allergy and immunology. To subscribe to Allergy Watch, head over to college dot A-C-A-A-I dot O-R-G slash publications slash Allergy Watch. Well, welcome again. My name is Jerry Lee. I'm an assistant editor at Allergy Watch and a co-host of this podcast. And I'd like to introduce my co- co-host, Stan Feynman. All right. Thank you. And uh, it's good to be here. I'm uh, editor-in-chief uh, of the of Allergy Watch for the college. I'm also a past president of the college. Um, I'm the clinical faculty at uh, an adjunct faculty at uh, Emory, and uh, I'm in private practice in Atlanta. And our other co-host, Dr. Kalangara. Hi, I'm Marin Kalangara, and I'm an assistant professor of allergy and immunology at Emory University. So we recorded episode four, which is part one of the July-August issue of Allergy Watch. And before we start with part two, I did want to bring to everyone's attention that for the next podcast, we have a main sub certification review issue. And so therefore for the podcast, we won't be reviewing that for obvious reasons. So on our break, we have invited Dr. Brian Vickery, who is Emory faculty and has a interest in food allergy or immunotherapy research. So for those who might have questions for Dr. Vickery, we'd like to review during the podcast, I would invite you to send your questions via email or Twitter. Uh, That email address again is allergytalk at acaai.org. So without further ado, I think Stan has a very interesting article about insect stings. Uh, Yes, this is the, uh, uh, an article uh, that's entitled investigation of the factors that determine the severity of allergic reactions to hominoptera venoms. And it was published in the uh, March issue this year of uh, Allergy and Asthma Proceedings. It was reviewed uh, by Vivian uh, uh, Hernandez-Trujillo. So uh, it's an interesting article because it's um, the experience of, uh, for a year and a half experience in a clinic in Turkey where the it looks like the predominant insects are honeybee stings and also wasp stings. Uh, that's a little different than we have here in, uh, in Atlanta. But what they did is they had uh, 82 patients uh, with a history of an allergic reaction to hymenoptera venom in their clinic. And then they looked at uh, various factors that they felt might be able to predict uh, the severity of their allergic reactions. And, um, you know, we all know that... Uh, Hominoptera venom reactions is a big problem. We s- certainly have a, a, a big problem here in Atlanta, uh, especially now in the summertime. So, uh, you know, anything we can do to sort of predict what's going to be, uh, who's going to be at risk of having a severe reaction, uh, you know, that would help us in determining, um, you know, uh, in advising and, and, and managing our patient. So anything we can do to help determine what would patient at the increased risk what would put the patient at increased risk would help us to manage those patients who uh, have had reactions to insect stings. So in terms of the methods, it was a prospective study. Uh, Patients were coming into their clinic and they had either a large local reaction or a systemic reaction. Uh, Large local was uh, defined as a a swelling of greater than uh, 10 centimeters and lasting for over 24 hours. And then the systemic reactions were based on uh, what was uh, the ring and uh, mesmer classification, which is a one through four type rating grading scale for anaphylactic reactions, one being just some uh, itching, flushing, and uh, four being uh, GI, vomiting, respiratory arrest, circulatory arrest, I mean, much more severe type reaction. Um, and, and anyway, this is a little bit of a problem, and we'll talk about this in just a minute because uh, it's a little bit of an older uh, 
uh, classification system for anaphylaxis. It was first described in uh, 77. So they did look at the presence of atopy in general, looking at various inhalant allergens that were positive. And, um, you know, they, and they looked at uh, other markers as well, besides uh, specific IgE to the venoms. Uh, they looked at uh, tryptase levels and uh, total IgE as well. So when you come to the uh, results, they found that there were uh, no significant differences between the patients. In other words, the, the types of patients were the same, and the incidence of the different stings were also the same. Uh, there was a significant difference regarding the frequency of allergic diseases between the systemic reactions and those who had large local reactions. Um, in terms of severity of systemic reactions, hymenoptera venom, uh, 22 patients, or 36 percent, were grade one, whereas 19 patients, uh, 31 percent, were grade two, and uh, 21 percent were um, grade three, and there were even six patients, uh, 10 percent, were grade four. So the most frequently reported symptoms, of course, were skin, hives, uh, and urticaria or angioedema that about 30 percent did have some respiratory, and 20 percent had uh, hypotension. But the uh, interesting findings, I think, uh, uh, the, the most interesting finding is the fact that uh, really tryptase levels uh, seem to have the most predicting effect. The elevated tryptase level uh, had a higher risk of having uh, uh, more severe reactions uh, after insect sting. The other thing that was, was an important factor was age. The older patients uh, were at greater risk. Uh, those who had um, high venom-specific IgE and total IgE were, were important, and those who had allergies were also uh, important factors as well. So, you know, when you come down to the, uh, the main risk factors, I think tryptase, again, once again, we're learning that tryptase is, is more of a predictor. We need to get tryptase levels in our patients who come in with systemic reactions to insect stings, and I think the big take-home message from this article is uh, we need to monitor that because those patients who had elevated baseline tryptase levels did have a greater risk for having more severe uh, reactions uh, and more anaphylaxis after the insect stings. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned also was the reaction severity correlated with venom specific Ig, which I wasn't aware of. Typically, mm -hmm. I don't use the Ig level to perfect severity, just the presence. So I, mm -hmm. that was very surprising to me. I wasn't sure if that's ever been shown in other scenarios or mm -hmm. other allergens. I don't think it reached statistical significance, okay. but it trended. Hmm. So it did not reach statistical significance. I see. So uh, it depends on whether you, you know, do your, logres your logistic regression analysis, uh, you know, in terms of which is the relationship. So. Uh, you know, it, it trended, but didn't. Hmm. And to be honest, I don't know if the actual level would really influence my decision to recommend immunotherapy. If it is positive, I think I would strongly recommend it anyway, so. Well, we do, that's for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, if it's positive, if you have a history of a generalized reaction and you uh, have a positive uh, allergy skin test, uh, you know, to the venom, then, then we clearly recommend venom mm -hmm. immunotherapy. It's one of the most effective therapies we have. Right. Oh, absolutely. And life-saving versus quality of life. Mm -hmm. Correct. Definitely, that's where we really want to, you know, potentially save our patient's life and uh, for the potentially life-saving treatment. Um, so, uh, Marin, I think you have a very interesting article also on uh, asthma in adults. Right. So, I chose a paper that was reviewed in Allergy Watch by John Oppenheimer and published by a group in the Netherlands in Jackie in Practice earlier this year. So asthma is being increasingly recognized to be very heterogeneous in terms of age of onset as well as pretty much everything. And asthma, new onset asthma can occur at any age. And there is in fact even very late onset asthma at greater than 75 years of age. Adult onset asthma is well recognized, often more severe, and in fact becomes the predominant phenotype among women aged 35 to 40 years of age. Its origins though, as compared to childhood asthma, are often poorly understood. 
There are several known triggers like aspirin, sensitivity, smoking, occupational exposures, hormonal factors, and psychosocial stressors. But the etiology is often not clearly elucidated. Also, while there are numerous follow-up cohorts of childhood asthma, these don't exist so much for adult asthma and especially for adult-onset asthma. There are so far three published cohorts of adult-onset asthma out of Europe, and the current cohort is a sub-study of Adonis that has been generated from the Netherlands. Their hypothesis was that various asthma triggers are associated with specific phenotypic characteristics or with specific asthma outcomes. And this particular study attempted to identify subgroups of different asthma phenotypes based on the patient's perception of their initial trigger to see whether this would help with characterization and prognostication. For instance, they postulated that some asthma phenotypes would have a high degree of remission, and perhaps these patients may only require biologics for a limited period of time. So they had a cohort of about 200 adults with recently diagnosed adult-onset adult asthma within the past year. The authors found that certain self-reported perceptions of the original trigger were associated with the onset of asthma and connected with the five-year prognosis, as well as several different in clinical as well as inflammatory characteristics. Chronic smokers were excluded from this cohort, as were patients with fixed obstruction. At five years following diagnosis, patients were followed up and asked the question, what, in your opinion, elicited your asthma? And the triggers were classified into 10 different categories, including upper respiratory symptoms, physician-diagnosed pneumonias, occupational exposures, not smoking but rather smoking cessation, the use of aspirin, postmenopausal, stressful life events, new allergic sensitizations, no triggers, and other triggers. Asthma remission was defined as no asthma symptoms and no medications for more than one year at the time of reassessment. The five most commonly reported categories were no trigger identified in nearly 40% of patients, upper respiratory tract symptoms in 22% of patients, new allergic sensitization in about 10%, pneumonia in 8% of patients, and a psych stressful life event in 7%. As anticipated, new allergic sensitization was associated with milder atopic asthma, relatively younger age of onset, and this aligns with results from prior cluster analyses. Those with upper respiratory symptoms at the start of their disease were older, they tended to have more type 2 inflammation with higher pheno, more intense eosinophilia, and this may herald the onset of nasal polyps in this population. And the asthma phenotype associated with nasal polyposis is often characterized clinically by refractory eosinophilic inflammation, and this aligns with the low rate of remission observed in this group. The two most interesting groups in this cohort were one, the patients who identified pneumonia as their initial trigger, and those with a life stressor as the inciting event. Patients who identified pneumonia as the initial trigger were typically associated with a prior history of smoking and low IgE, and a third of these patients had their asthma remit over five years. Infections have been associated with prolonged airway hyperreactivity and new onset asthma diagnoses, and the authors suggest that this diagnosis of post-infectious pneumonia may often be premature and may represent just a temporary airway hyperresponsiveness associated with non-type 2 or TLR pathways. It was also interesting that the subgroup with a life stressor as the inciting event, which accounted for about 7% of the total cohort, had zero cases of remission. And further, they had high symptom scores, there was no apparent inflammatory pattern, and they were typically posigranulocytic. There is a known relationship between life stressors with asthma onset as well as asthma worsening in adolescents and in adults, and the authors postulate that various factors play into persistence of asthma in this group, such as steroid insensitivity and over-perception of dyspnea. Uh, 
The largest group in the study were those who were not able to identify an initial inciting trigger. They showed relatively low blood eosinophils. Some of them had high sputum neutrophils and may represent two important factors that were not included in this questionnaire, that is smoking and obesity, which have both been shown to be established risk factors for asthma and in fact also air pollution. A quarter of these patients without any obvious trigger remitted by five years. A major limitation of this study was the small numbers and the lack of analysis of several significant exposures. But I thought this was an interesting paper in view of the increasing emphasis on asthma phenotyping with the advent of precision medicine in order to further understand the potential disease course among patients. And to summarize, the authors suggest that patient perceptions of the original trigger may help us to identify subgroups of patients with different clinical characteristics and inflammatory characteristics, as well as vastly different prognoses for their asthma. That's interesting because I find that a lot of times patients come in and they can't identify their triggers. And, you know, so... But I, I agree. I mean, it's interesting that we're all trying to find out the right phenotype and then hopefully can direct the therapy appropriately. Right. And when we see adult onset asthma, I often see some of these characteristics where, and I, and I think this is very well reported, where they're non-allergic, they might have had an infectious event or a significant smoking history or so on. And, and clearly, I have some of those patients who don't respond to the therapies. So anything we can do to have further help on a lot of these challenging patients mm -hmm. that don't respond the same way as we're used to in childhood asthma is immensely needed. And I, I'm glad we're taking steps like this. Right. And even prior to reading this paper, I have used several of these sort of screening questions. When I see a patient with nuanced asthma and suspected nasal polyps, I usually ask them, did it start off as a bad cold that just never went away? Hmm. Or do they have a history of smoking cessation shortly prior to onset of symptoms and things like that? I'd love to see what that looks like. Uh <laughs> I'm sure you're going to release that one. That's great. Um, I have one more article I was going to review. This was reviewed by Dr. Brad Chips, and the title of his article in Allergy Watch is At All Ages, Ozone and PM 2.5 Aspect, uh, I'm sorry, Ozone and PM 2.5 Affect Respiratory ED Visits. And this was published in the Blue Journal, and the name of the article was Age Specific Associations of Ozone and Fine Particulate Matter with Respiratory Emergency Department Visits in the United States. This study was uh, published down the street. As you know, down the street from us is the CDC. And as one of the missions of the CDC, it's the monitoring of the health of the U.S. population by looking at exposures. And one of, as you know, one of those relevant exposures is air pollution. So they're talking about two major exposures, ground level ozone. As we know, ground level ozone is happening right now. It's August, it's warm, it's hot. And with the right temperature and the, excuse me, with the right temperature and the right sunlight content, uh, compounds released from car exhaust or other sources do get converted to ground level ozone. The other one they mentioned is PM 2.5. So particulate matter of 2.5 microns or less that have that delivery to the lower airway. Uh, the source of particulate matter primarily is traffic related, uh, diesel pollution from trucks driving down all the highways. I see from this building actually, mm -hmm. You know, we're in a clinic right next to the highway. And that traffic-related pollution and proximity to a highway has been associated with wheezing and asthma. A lot of what I learned about traffic-related pollution was from my fellowship training. I trained at Cincinnati. They had the CC CAP study, which is the Cincinnati Childhood Allergy and Air Pollution Study with uh, Grace Lamasters, David Bernstein, mm 
Dr. Nero Hershey, I was working at Dr. Nero Hershey's lab during my fellowship. And it was incredible how the interplay between particulate matter exposure from diesel and allergy work together to act as a strong adjuvant. If you co-expose somebody to an allergen in the context of diesel pollution, your IgE responses, airway eosinophilia markedly increase. It is a strong adjuvant. So the previous epidemiological data we know about pollution is based on Medicare data because essentially that is a national database. But, but as opposed to other countries that have single payer healthcare, we knew very little about under 65. So this was a collaborative effort between uh, 17 states and this program called the Center for Disease Control and Prevention National Environmental Public Health Tracking Program. And so this is a data set that has 894 countries, 138.5 million Americans, which is essentially 40% of the U.S. population. And what they were able to do is get daily emergency department data and link that to estimated ozone and fine particulate matter, that PM 2.5 for the preceding week, where estimates for each pollution at 0 to 18, 19 to 64, and then of course the 65 and older, which we already know about, for different outcomes. The particular outcomes they looked at was acute respiratory infection, asthma, COPD, pneumonia, and ED visits for all respiratory conditions. And what I thought was very interesting from this article is this is all public data. So if you wanted to know what the estimates of pollution in your environment were on a county level, you could go to the CDC website. It's ephtracking.cdc.gov. I actually pull, put in <laughs> Fulton County just to see what it looked like. As you can imagine, it wasn't actually it wasn't as bad as I thought, honestly. But uh, the uh, information from that website, which is based on monitor models of pollution correlating with actual pollution trackers, uh, was correlated to this ED data. And what they found was if you have a 10 micron per meter squared increase in PM 2.5, you'll have increased respiratory EV, ED visits of 1.024 among children, which is the strongest association, and that lowers to 1.008 for the 19 to 64, and then 1.002 for over 65, which ended up being no association. Now, that was different and almost reverse for ozone. So for ozone, a 20 parts per billion increase for ozone, that rate ratio was highest for over 65. That was 1.033, and it was the lowest for that under 18 population. That's 1.017. So you could see that ozone is more relevant as a trigger for asthma in adults for ED visits, and the inverse is for traffic-related pollution like PM 2.5, which it was more relevant to children. Now, what was also interesting about this was that there was an editorial that was published by the California Department of Health. And what the editorial stated, which I didn't know, is that currently there is a um, sort of a rule at the EPA, it's called a transparency rule, transparency rule. So the transparency rule by the EPA states this. If a regulator is going to consider a change in air quality standards, they want to see the data, right? You got to show me the data if you're going to make me do a policy change in air pollution. Well, guess what? This is confidential ED data. <laughs> this is patient information. They can't release that information. So guess what? If they don't have the data, According to their transparency rule, they can't change air quality standards. So there's just that kind of catch-22 that even if we do show how important air quality is in respiratory health, because of certain uh, policies at the EPA, this data may not be used to change policy. That's a shame. Mm -hmm. 
That's a shame. I mean, you know, uh, I, this was obviously a fascinating study, uh, uh, you know, bringing things up to date. I happen to remember when the Olympics were here in Atlanta in 1996. Um, and it was unique because during that time, uh, they recommended nobody drive downtown. So they basically, that was the start of telecommuting. And for the week, uh, the two and a half weeks of the Olympics, basically the highways were empty. So this same section in the CDC with, in collaboration with Emory, looked at the data of the emergency room visits for pediatrics and found that there was a 41% reduction in emergency room visits for pediatric asthma during the two and a half weeks of the Olympics here in Atlanta. There was a 19% reduction in hospitalizations for asthma. Wow. Now there was no change in GI illness. So <laughs> it wasn't because the kids left the right. city, but right. clearly the reduction in the pollutants, the, uh, uh, the ozone, uh, particulate matter, uh, the, the uh, car exhaust basically uh, was very impactful in reducing uh, pediatric uh, emergency room visits and flare-ups for asthma. So we know that the data is here. I, I'm, I'm sorry that that rule is there. <laughs> I'd like to see more regulation. Right. Yeah, and... I guess that's an editorial. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want to protect our patients. Right. <clears throat> but, yeah, this sort of goes in line with lots of recent studies that have been published on asthma and air quality and exposure to ozone at even thresholds lower than recommended by the National Ambient Air Quality Standards have been associated with significant pulmonary as well as just systemic inflammatory changes in adolescents as well as adults. And just like with everything else related to asthma, it, it's been found to have very significant socioeconomic disparities and just, again, reinforces that asthma is a health equity issue. Oh, oh absolutely. And so my hope is, is that as people make decisions about how to reduce the burden of health, and I think a lot of that's mm -hmm. focusing on insurance coverage, we have to recognize there's multiple determinants of health right. and that's beyond it. You're mentioning disparities and economic reasons. And now we're talking about environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. You really have to look at the whole thing. I, I remember there's this website I go to on health equity at the Robert Wood Johnson website and it has a good summary of what you really <laughs> have to, to tackle equity and health. It is multiple, multiple mm -hmm. interventions and just focusing on one might not fully address some of the things that we're seeing. So um, that's the end of our episode. I really appreciate your attention. And again, I do want to remind the viewers, number one, not, I mean, listeners, I want to remind the listeners not only to rate our podcast on iTunes, but also send us any questions you have for Dr. Vickery for our next episode. I think it'd be very interesting to have a conversation about where we are with food allergy oral immunotherapy that website again is allergy talk at acaai.org and that's another opportunity again we welcome your feedback any corrections and any comments about anything we've talked about today have a wonderful day everyone the acaai is presenting this podcast for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice or intended to replace the judgment of a licensed physician. The college is not responsible for any claims related to the procedures, professionals, products, or methods discussed in the podcast, and it does not approve or endorse any products, professionals, services, or methods that might be referenced. Today's speakers have the following disclosures. Dr. Lee was on an advisory board for Teva. Dr. Kalangarda has received consulting fees from AstraZeneca, and Dr. Feynman has been a speaker for AZBI Shire and has done research for AIMUN, DBV, Shire, and Regeneron.